address just a, a topic of uh, kind of the, the, the weaknesses of believers and, and uh, people in general, but um, it's kind of good that this is on the heels of, you know, the, the fundamentals laid out in the Bible study, which was, was uh, excellent. And um, kind of talk about, you know, how believers should sail through difficult times or things that they should consider. And uh, if you don't know the Lord or you're uncertain of your interest in, in Christ, then some things for you to consider. And first, I want to start with a quote from a top lady text. He says, uh, I have it at the top of your thing there, the distresses of God's people are various and flow from a vast multiplicity of sources. They are tried by the world outwardly and inwardly by their own corruptions. A believing man's greatest foes are often those of his own house and especially the many evils that are in his own heart. How pathetically did Paul complain of the body of sin and death which he carried about with him and how deeply did he groan being burdened. God is pleased sometimes to hide his face, then are the souls of his people cast down and disquieted within them. But a great, perhaps the greater part of their trouble and distress arise from a consciousness of their own barrenness, ingratitude, and want of fervor in their Redeemer's service. I kind of, when I read that, I, I was just really picking up on this idea. Uh, Psalm, the psalmist said in Psalm 51, that uh, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And I think that, you know, believers live with this fact that uh, they have a they have a redeemer and, and if, if it weren't for his payment for their sin, woe is them because they, they're so conscious of their weaknesses, their barrenness. They're so conscious of the many evils, as Top Lady says, that are in their own, they're in their, that are in their own heart. And some of those, in some cases, those weaknesses make it difficult. For example, uh, when I see a promise in the Word, uh, I, I, I will be doubtful. Is that for me? Or am I thinking that's for me and, my, and to consume it upon my own desires? When I see a correction in the Word, I can assume it doesn't apply to me or does it apply to me? And I can live in this world of doubt. So how does, should the believer move forward? in these situations and, and to add to that issues there are so many things of uncertainty and confusion and doubt and despair I just I put some verses here different verses I'll, I'll kind of tick them off for you things that Paul went through mostly um, in Romans 14 verses 1 to 3 he said uh, talking about receiving uh, some believers who felt like you should eat this thing or not eat that thing he said him that's weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So doubtful disputations can float around in your life. Should you do this? Should you not do this? Where, what's the word say on this? Um, you can, Paul said in 2 Corinthians that he was pressed out of measure. In fact, he said, talking about when he went to Asia, he said, uh, don't, don't be ignorant of this, the trouble we came to in Asia. He said that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much as we despaired even of life. <coughs> so Paul went through some uh, some very difficult times. Uh, when you say pressed out of measure, beyond what I thought I could take. I, 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 you know, I was at the breaking point, above my strength. I despaired even of life. Would I even make it through this? Uh, in Psalm 119, I turned to Psalm 119. We're going to spend a, a fair bit of time there. In and out. Preached on this not that long ago, but I want to come at it a different way. In Psalm 119 and verse 107, the psalmist says, I'm afflicted very much. Very much. Um, in Psalm 119, verse 143, he says, Trouble and anguish have taken hold on me. And so, uh, you know, believers can be uh, in these situations, afflicted, anguished, pressed out of measure, doubtful. All these things are normal 
uh, parts of the human condition, parts of walking a life of faith. Um, in 2 Corinthians 4, you don't need to turn there, but Paul said, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. And then finally, uh, if you flip over uh, to Isaiah, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, and chapter 50. Keep your finger in Psalm, though. We'll come back there. In Psalm 50, uh, in verse 10, it says, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness, has no light? <clears throat> Let him trust in the name of, of the Lord and stay upon his God. I guess if I were to say what I'm going to sum up is, I'm going to sum up the second part of that. But the first part of that is... Uh, a servant who obey the fears the Lord but walks in darkness doesn't have light on something doesn't doesn't know which way to go and uh, there's wise counsel in the second part of that I'm going to expand on that let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God that's uh, wise advice so to expand on that how might one go about uh, staying upon his God and I have three things to encourage you with and some other comments. The three things are, number one, in verse 11 of Psalm 119, hide the word of God in your heart. Thy word I've hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Um, you're not going to hide anything if you don't know it. So uh, you're not going to be able to meditate. That's just part two in verse 15. It says meditate on that word. Verse 15, I'll meditate in thy precepts, have respect to your ways. You know, meditate again this assumes that you know that word is out in front of you and so I urge you again and I know that it's been a consistent message from this pulpit for as long as we this church has been here and even before this building but when we were gathering was how important the word is in your daily life uh, crack open the Bible uh, when you're before you go to bed when you're sitting by the way when you're sitting on the toilet wherever whenever however crack open the word and uh, let god minister to you there and and hide the word in your heart and meditate on that word you can't meditate on what you don't know uh third thing i would say is in verse 18 where it says uh, open my eyes that i may behold wondrous things out of the law uh, but uh, go to god in prayer in your affliction, in your distress, in your being despair, in your anguish, in your trouble, whatever that is. And uh, in verse 27, call upon God and give, give you grace to understand, make you understand his word and what, why he has you where you're at. You, know, you may or may not need, need to know, but cause him to make you to understand in verse 27. Um, in verse 32, it says... Uh, Enlarge my heart. Ask God to, to give you, again, wisdom and understanding in your situation. Uh, in verse 35 of Psalm 119, um, make me to go in the path of thy commandments. Give me grace to go the right direction. Um, there's a verse, uh, I think it's in Proverbs, that says, man doesn't know good or evil by all that's before him. Uh, we can not necessarily we, we, without light we, we don't always know the right way to go in any given situation but pray that God enlarge your heart enlarge your understanding make you to go in the path of his commandments to go according to what his word says in verse 38 it says establish thy word unto thy servant now this is kind of an exciting that the word established there is from a Hebrew word that means is to cause it to arise or to raise or to give effect to so what he's saying here is Make your word alive to me. Give me understanding. When, that word, when I read that word, make it pop off the page and raise up to me so that I see that or I didn't see it before. So that I have comfort and direction about the way to go. So when it says establish your word, he's saying give it effect to me. Make it, give it an effect. Uh, and when, when I think of it to give effect to, it's kind of like if you have a written word, it's like I'm going to 
put that in a yellow highlighter and I'm going to underline it. Notice this word. And when he says establish this word, he's basically saying that thing. You know, I'm saying make it pop out to me so that I see the point of what's in here. And in verse 73, give me understanding. In verse 133, here's the other piece. Order my steps in thy word. Not just that I understand the word, but give me God to walk that way, to be obedient to it. It's one thing to understand it. It's another thing to walk according to it. And pray that God, as it says, order my steps in thy word, to be desire to be obedient and to, be, to obey the word. And then in verse 145, <clears throat> cry out to God with your whole heart. She says, I cried with my whole heart. Lay your case out before God in your distress, in your perplexity, in your doubt, in your trouble, in your despair, in your lack of light, which is going to happen. And cry unto the Lord uh, that he hear you, that he... Um, and, and cry for what, I should say. Look in verse 154. Please plead my cause and deliver me. Deliver me. I've, you know, I've often thought, so many times, I don't know about you all, I think it's the same for every believer, but I feel like my whole life has been a series of, I just get pulled out of the burning building right before it collapses. I don't know if you have that feeling. But I, I, it's just over and over and over again. The Lord will take believers through situations where they think, how in the world am I going to get out of this? And the Lord delivers at the last moment. And they think, wow. <laughs> it causes the heart to swell up and praise him. But plead my cause and deliver me. Deliver me this time. Deliver me next time. Deliver me the time after that. And finally, in the end, eternally deliver me. And, and that's, the, that's the sweet cry of the believer. And, and I might also add uh, on this, in, in verse 63, as you're going through these difficult times, and these times of anguish and trouble, the psalmist says, I'm a companion of all them that fear thee. It's a good thing to be companions with those that fear him, companions that pray for you, companions that care for your soul, and uh, not the companion of, of those that would uh, take advantage of that situation or uh, discourage you in the way of the Lord, but rather to be a companion of those that fear God. It's a good thing. Second, uh, the third point I would make is where there's this doubt and this fear and this lack of light that uh, will come in your lifetime, pray in verse 130. Again, uh, the entrance of thy words gives light. Um, in verse one, in uh, verse one hundred five, it says, "Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path." The point I'm making here is that it's always the case that in these situations, that the way through it, the way through it, is by the light of the word and God's ministering to you. And as you meditate on that word, and as you think on that word, and as God brings believers to counsel you about that word. That's the direction to go. That's the light under your path. You don't know which way to go. You're walking in darkness. Pray that God give you that light at your feet so you know which way to go. Um, unlike us who live in, in, always live in a certain degree of doubt and fear, wandering about, you know, wondering this, wondering that, Recall the mind that God is, an un is unchangeable. He's not like us. He doesn't change with every wind. He doesn't, you know, I wake up this morning, I'm a little moody. Tomorrow I wake up bright and cheery. The day after that, I'm going to wake up a different way. But depending on my mood, who knows which way I'm going to go on any given moment. Recall the mind that God is unchangeable like us. And neither is his word. That forever is his word settled in heaven, it says in verse 89. And that because the Lord doesn't change, there's hope for us. He doesn't change. We change and our moods and our how we handle our difficulties is going to, some days we're going to feel great. Some days we're ready for the challenge. Some days we're going to sink under the weight to despair, as Paul did. 
when he said, uh, you know, uh, we were pressed out of measure to the point where I despaired of life. And that may come your direction, but recall the mind that the Lord doesn't change. His word is settled forever. His care for his people is certain. And uh, and to call upon him, call upon him, cry out with your cry to the Lord that he you know, plead, plead your cause and deliver you. The fourth point I want to make is <clears throat> to meditate on the faithfulness God, of God in your challenge. Um, we can take comfort that we worship a sovereign God. The world doesn't have that comfort. The world, they're going to afflict themselves thinking, well, I didn't do this, therefore God's punishing me, or I did this, therefore God's blessing me. They're going to run around and chase their tail thinking along those lines. They're going to be thinking about works. Things aren't happening because I didn't do something. Things are happening because I did something. And that's going to drive them into their own despair over you know, at, at some point. But rather than think upon, you know, God's judgments are right. Uh, if he's brought something my way, uh, verse 75, if you would. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right. Whatever the situation, thy judgments are right. That means whatever I'm at and whatever despair I'm in, I'm here because you have me here. And it says, uh, thy judgments are right and thou, that thou in faithfulness has afflicted me. So wherever I'm at and when I'm going through these periods of, of, uh, of low light, the Lord has in faithfulness afflicted me. In verse 75 and verse 71, the psalmist says, it's good for me that I've been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. So these things that we go through, these times he delivers us over and over and over again, is for our instruction and correction and for our own enlightenment and betterment so that we might help others along the way as well. Um, <clears throat> and the fifth point I would make is that in these difficult times, you know, resolve not to trust your heart. You know, you, we've, you've heard from the preaching here over and over through the years in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says that the, the heart is a, is a deceitful thing, desperately wicked, who can know it? Don't go by your heart. Again, go by the word. Go by wholesome counsel. Uh, don't uh, uh, don't let your emotions rule your life. Let the word give you direction and light. Um, so many people, as as Pastor Chuck has said so many times, uh, we live in an age of emotion. There used to be a there was a years ago they called it the age of reason back in the near the Refor Reformation. It was the age of reason. Well, what we now have now is the age of emotion. Everybody runs on emotion. And uh, let the word of God and the logic of the word give you guidance and light. <clears throat> and coming down to um, the last point before a fairly long conclusion, um, call, the, call to mind Christ's work on the behalf of sinners, that no matter how dark, no matter the despair, no matter the confusion, no matter the anguish, no matter how weighty the problem is, whatever you're going through, nothing will be as momentous as the judgment of God upon sinners when it's all laid out for everyone to see. Now turn to Romans chapter 8. This was actually... <laughs> Somehow or another, this was the catalyst for what I was what I'm bringing for you this morning. In Romans 8, <clears throat> beginning in verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. We can comfort ourselves in that. We walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Here's the, here's the punchline. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now that phrase, that last phrase, that the righteousness of the law, um, I was reading uh, different Greek renditions of this. 
But where it says the, the righteousness of God, uh, the law might be fulfilled in us. That word in is ada nu, which is oftentimes, and I've got some verses there for you, it's routinely translated as, as for. It's in or for. And so it, this may well be read that the righteousness required by the law might be fulfilled for us or in our stead or in our place. And that recall the mind that, the, that all that's required of God and all that God demands and the rightness that we we so desperately lack, the righteousness of God has been fulfilled for us in Christ on that cross. And that's a great hope. Recall that to mind in despair. Say, uh, I don't stand or fall on how I master my situation. I, I stand or fall solely on the work of Christ and that's my hope. So, in conclusion, for believers, as we confront, confront tribulations in our life, there will be many, and they will not stop until your breathing does. Uh, recall this to mind. Jesus said, uh, in the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. There's a hopeful thought. Uh, in these tribulations that that you will have in the world, be of good cheer. He has overcome. He has delivered righteousness for you. He accomplished it for you. What a great hope that is. And he sent a comforter to guide believers. Um, in John 16, let me see if I gave you that verse. John 16, 3. Go ahead and turn there, if you will. And we're going to go, go to Jeremiah after that. In John 16 and verse 13, it says, Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide. He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. He will show you things to come. And so, uh, we can be of good cheer because of the work of Christ. The Spirit of God uh, will guide. He will guide. He will guide. Um, but God has laid out in, in Psalms and in other places, you know, where to go in those times of darkness, where to go in times of despair, and how to go there. He's laid it out for you, and the Spirit of truth will guide. No, no failure, no matter how great. No affliction, even if it takes us despair, no doubt no matter how unsettling that doubt is, can undo God's love for his people or unwind the righteousness that he has fulfilled on our behalf. Turn to Jeremiah 29. A passage that I heard uh, Richard Warmack preached, I, I think to good effect. <clears throat> Verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. And uh, believers can take this comfort knowing that uh, there's a happy ending. There's a happy ending to the story. There will be a happy ending to your story, though you may go through a lot of grief in the meantime. In fact, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 11, you don't need to turn there, talk, talking about uh, the faithful of time past. Well, some were sawn asunder. Some had cruel mockings. Uh, let me read this. Uh, some were stoned. Some were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. You know, are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for that, that you might have to hide in a mountain or a cave lest you be killed for your belief? It's happened to believers in time past. But uh, take hope in this, that there is, a, there, there is a happy ending to all this. We do have a spirit that guides us in the truth and hope and comfort no matter what the, the, the problems. For those uncertain of their interest in Christ, I have a verse there. And this verse... I, I <laughs> I was thinking about this verse a lot this week, and this is this should be, should be terrifying. It should be terrifying to everyone on the face of the earth. 
It says, For God shall bring every work into judgment, every secret thing. It, uh, <clears throat> whether it be good or whether it be evil. And, and I was thinking, I, there's a, just to give you a sense of the shame, I was uh, reading about the, there's a, just an internet scam going on where some Russian hackers or whatever, they'll send a note to, uh, uh, send you an email and they'll say, well, I know everything you've done. I know every site you've ever visited and I've been videotaping you while you've been on your machine the whole time and I'm going to show this to everyone on your email list. And I thought, that's going to shock some people. That's going to be a pretty shocking event. And I thought, two things about that. One, how much more will the shame be when God shows every secret thing that goes on in your mind and in judgment? What, a, what a, an unbelievably horrifying moment that's going to be for men outside of Christ to stand there before God at every secret thing. Uh, it's, it's going to be laid out. Uh, are you ready for that trial? And how are you going to defend yourself before a holy God? And uh, are you prepared to meet him? Because one day he's going to rip through the heavens, as his word says. And time as we know it will, will come to an end. And that uh, could be this afternoon. It could be a hundred years from now. It could be next week. In Hebrews 10, 31, it says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. This is serious. This is a serious thing. This is a serious thing. And he promises that he's going to bring your work into judgment, my work into judgment, every secret thing, everything that no one else knows about you in the videotape of your mind is going to be laid out before all to see. So if, you are, if you're ashamed of one little thing, imagine if God lays out everything before all to see. And uh, so I urge you, if you do not know or you're uncertain of your interest in Christ, call upon him while he may be found in the preaching. And he show mercy to you uh, and now and for all your days and throughout eternity. Call upon him that you might know that you know him. And, and I'll close in verse 77 of Psalms 119. I would call upon God in this manner as the psalmist says praying unto God let thy tender mercies come unto me that I may live your living is going to be a function of if God extends tender mercies to you those tender mercies are in Christ and his work that righteousness that, uh, that fulfilled the law for you if you're to know may it be that you find them and that you understand the seriousness of this matter and that uh, if you're uh, if you know him that you make it through these times of difficulty and you'll have many of them distress perplexion look to God look in his word search out in his word meditate on his word pray be in prayer cry out God deliver me be a companion of all those that fear the Lord. Find your hope in the work of Christ.